Hi, my name is Patricia Fisher, and I'm the principal percussionist for the Livonia Symphony, the Rochester Symphony, and the Motor City Brass Band, all in the state of Michigan. Today we're going to do a demonstration of metal percussion instruments, or metallophones. As we have said in previous videos, we categorize percussion instruments three different ways. We have membranophones, which are things with skins. We have instruments made out of wood, like claves, wood blocks, temple blocks. And now we're going to do the instruments made out of metal, metallophones, which include cymbals, triangles, and gongs. So the three main instruments you'll see in an orchestra or a concert band are the cymbals, the triangles, and the gongs. There's a bunch of other metal, metal instruments as well, which we will show later on. So let's first start with cymbals. So here's a nice 14-inch cymbal. Cymbals are basically made out of brass, but then they have other uh, metal alloys mixed in with the brass. Now these recipes are very secret between all the various uh, companies that make cymbals. This is a Sabian symbol. There's Zildjian, there's Paiste, there's Meinl, there's Istanbul, there's Turkish. They all have different recipes, which is based on what kind of alloys they mix with the brass to make the symbol. And they make these kind of big pancakes of metal, pound them out with a hammer, sometimes manually or with a machine, and then sometimes they carve them down, which is why you see these kind of rip, uh, ridges in the symbol. They car carve them down, or sometimes they don't carve them down. They leave them with, without any ridges at all, and that makes the symbol. So this particular one is Sabian, and the Zildjian family and the Sabian family are actually the same family. They're two different brothers. Each brother got a different recipe from their father. So let's take a look at symbols. So you're probably used to seeing drumstick players on TV playing cymbals with a drumstick like this, which we do do in orchestra and concert band. Now, when you see them on TV playing drumstick, you might see them playing a steady rhythm on the cymbal, which we called riding the cymbal, which is like this. Or you might hear them doing another riding of the cymbal, which is like a swing pattern. You might also see them crash the cymbal with a stick. In band and orchestra, we might do all three of those things. It depends on the music we're playing. And a lot of times, if you see in your band parts or in your orchestra parts, a little line that says cymbal with wood or cymbal with wood stick, they mean use a wood stick and crash it. But there are a lot of other ways that we play cymbals in an orchestra or in a concert band. One of the main ways is with mallets. Now these are mallets, these particular mallets are marimba mallets that were made to play the middle to low end of a marimba. So they're a little softer and a little heavier than a regular uh, marimba mallet. Now if you've seen any old drum set videos, you might see the drum set player playing uh, cymbals and tom-toms with timpani sticks. Um, what we do in the, in the orchestra is we use these low end marimba mallets and some companies actually make specific cymbal mallets that are wrapped like a marimba mallet are, but they're made specifically by the cymbal company for cymbals. And so what do we do with these? Well, we hit the cymbal to make a splashy sound like this. Or we might roll with these on the cymbal uh, to make this sound. Now, if you see, my hand, hands are spread apart, and when I, I roll on a cymbal, I'm rolling on the edges or maybe an inch in from the edges, but on both sides of the cymbal. I'm not doing it in one place like this where I'm playing right in one specific spot. Now, if I move it out, I'm not playing any harder, but you should hear the cymbal sound a little bit differently. So let's try that again. I'm playing here in one spot, and now I'm moving out along the edges, the circumference of the symbol. Now, symbols can come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. This one is 14 inches, which is a 
little small. Let's take a look at another one. And this is a special symbol. This symbol is what we would call a china symbol. We call it that because it has a square dome and the edges are up, slightly turned up. Now this particular china symbol also has rivets in it, which if you can see, I'm kind of lifting a rivet up right there. That's these little metal that kind of look like nails that are stuck in the holes around the edge of the symbol. Now, I don't know who made this symbol because whatever the marking was that determined the manufacturer has pretty much worn off of this symbol. I got it used at a store. Let's see what this symbol sounds like. Okay, this symbol is approximately 20 to 21 inches wide. So it's quite a big bit wider than this one. Let's see what this sounds like with the mallets on the outside edges. can hear the cymbal with the rivets. The rivets kind of make a buzzy sound after you hit the cymbal. So you don't just hear the ring of the cymbal, you also hear the buzzing of the rivets. So what does a snare drum stick sound like on this cymbal? Well, let's find out. That's kind of a different sound. It's kind of got a sharper sound to it than the 14-inch cymbal did. And in some drum set situations, you might even have somebody ride on a cymbal like this, which sounds like this. That's a very different cymbal sound than the one we had on the smaller 14 inch cymbal. So we also have really, really small cymbals as well. This is a 10 inch, what they call splash cymbal. This is a peisty symbol. So let's hear what a splash symbol sounds like with a drumstick. Now, just like when playing bass drum, there are times when you want to hit the symbol and dampen it, and times when you just want to let it ring. So you have to kind of practice when you're doing it with two mallets how you dampen the cymbal at the same time as you're playing it. So for instance, splash cymbals don't really work really well when you're doing them with a mallet, but let's see what this sounds like. A lot of times when you're doing um, music, say from the ragtime era, splash cymbals are used a lot in that kind of music. So there's another way to play cymbals. Maybe you see this in music where you see cymbals and then it has a little A, like an at sign, like you'd see like on your email, at, and then it says 2A, or it might just say 2A. That means you're playing two hand cymbals together and crashing them together. So just so you know how to do it, I know in marching bands sometimes you get taught to put your hand through the strap when you're marching in case for some reason your grip lets go you can still sort of keep the cymbal from falling on the ground but when we're playing with classical cymbals in band and orchestra we just take the handle like this we wrap our fingers and our hand around it and we put our thumb on the bell and we do the same thing for both cymbals see right there wrap my hand around it and put my thumb on the bell so what does crashing cymbals look like well, let me show you. You just take the two cymbals and very softly you move them together. Or you need to crash loud. A lot of times you need to crash loud. So that would sound like this. playing marches both in concert band and out in the field you would just crash them together along with the bass drum with a very steady rhythm probably about a medium volume
takes a lot of practice to get good crashes from a crash cymbal. When you first start out, you might hear something like this. See how you got a flam there? The flam is actually a good thing, but you want to get it so that when you crash your cymbals, you don't actually hear the flam. You just hear the cymbal sound. So there are a lot of different ways to suspend a cymbal. This was used on a drum set stand, which you see with drum set players all the time, but it's a post that goes straight down into the stand with the legs that flay out. Now for drum set, that's okay because you're just hitting the cymbal really hard most of the time, or like I said, riding on it. In a lot of classical situations, classical percussionists don't like to use this kind of stand because they believe that the vibration of the cymbal goes down through the post and into the floor. So you're really not getting the full flavor of the cymbal. So a lot of the older school percussionists and classical percussionists will use something called a gooseneck. Now this isn't actually an official gooseneck. I'm using this as a substitute for a gooseneck. So what they do is they take the leather handle or a rope handle like this one, and they put it through the cymbal hole and then they dangle the cymbal from the gooseneck stand off of the handle, off of the rope or the leather handle. Now they do this because the rope and the leather absorb the vibration coming out of the cymbal. So it's not going down directly through the floor. It's just going out from the cymbal. So let's start with our 14 inch cymbal and let's see what that sounds like when it's suspended from a gooseneck stand. Again, outer edges of the cymbal, not together. Here we go. probably sounds a little different than when I played it from the post stand here. Definitely sounds different when I'm rolling. But now the cool thing about a gooseneck stand, as you can see, I got a handle here, is that I can also use the cymbals that I crash with and put them on the gooseneck, just like this, and use them to do rolls and, and, and splashes with them as well, or hit them with a stick, like this. Or do splashes or rolls with the mallets. So again, even though this is a metal stand and most gooseneck stands are metal, because I'm suspending the cymbal from the leather handle and the leather handle is absorbing some of the vibration, the vibration isn't going down into the floor. It's just going out into the air, which is a beautiful thing. So let's talk about some other really interesting special effects you can do with cymbals, because you will see some of these. For instance, you might see um, a notation in your music that says cymbal swoosh, maybe with triangle beater or with a guiro comb would sound like this. A triangle beater, it would sound like this. Let's try it on this cymbal, the tiny cymbal, the 14 inch one. Again, with the grooves, both of these were uh, specifically shaved, so they do have the grooves on them. Try that again. That's a cool special effect sound from a cymbal. It does really work a lot better when you have a cymbal that has been shaved as opposed to this cymbal, which is somewhat shaved, but not as, as shaved with grooves as, as high as are on these cymbals. So just so you know, elementary school, middle school kids, cymbals can get hurt. They can get damaged and they can get cracked. So I'm going to play you right now a cymbal that has had a lot of bad things happen to it. 
See, look at that symbol there. I, I forget even where I got this. I think it was on an old drum set that I bought used, and it was part of the drum set, so I got the symbol with it. This bent probably had some micro cracks in it I haven't found yet, but this is what this sounds like. Now compare that sound. Kind of sounds dead to this sound. See how much longer this one rings compared to that one? And the same is true when you roll on it. You get a build up on the roll, but then when you move the sticks away and it should ring, there's almost no ring coming out of this. See how that almost dies away immediately? So, you can damage cymbals. So be careful what you use on your cymbals when you're playing on them. Sticks are okay. Marimba mallets are okay. Timpani sticks that have felt on them are okay. They're not great. Do not use bell mallets like plastic bell mallets and metal bell mallets on your cymbals. You can damage the cymbals. And as I mentioned with the bass drum demonstration, cymbals are not inexpensive. They cost some money. So if you damage a cymbal, your band might be out of a cymbal. And that's not a good thing. So let's talk about the second most used instrument made out of metal in the percussion section for an orchestra or a concert band. And that would be the triangle. Now triangles also come in various sizes and manufacturers. This one happens to be an Alan Abel triangle. Alan Abel was a percussionist with the Philadelphia Orchestra who specifically designed this triangle for use with the Philadelphia Orchestra. And now it's pretty much become a standard triangle everywhere. This is what this triangle sounds like. Now, triangles also come in lots of different sizes. So here's a different one. This is a Sabian triangle. And this one is made more out of brass. That one's made more out of steel. And this one is clearly a different shape, a different shape of triangle. And it is also a larger triangle. Let's see what this one sounds like. It's got a lot more shimmer. It's a lower pitch than that triangle was. So you can see where you could use this one in one situation and that one in a different musical situation, which happens all the time. If you're a professional player for orchestra and band, you might have two or three, maybe four triangles, each made of a different metal material and different sizes. So let's talk a little bit more about triangle beaters. So I've noticed a couple times when I've worked with students that they see a beater like this, and then they assume that this part is the handle, but it's not. That's actually the playing surface. I'm going to get this close enough to you. If you can see it, there's actually rubber or plastic in this part here. So if I tried to play the triangle with the plastic part, thinking that this wide area is the handle, it sounds like this. Now, aside from the fact that the handle is actually really thin on this particular triangle beater, because it's covered with plastic, you don't get the sound you want. But if you use this end, see how much different that sounds? So these are called Stussel, which is a manufacturer triangle beater. And he has a whole set of them that go to really big fat ones that are really, really loud and really tiny, tiny, itty bitty skinny ones. So remember when you see this kind of triangle beater, that's not the handle. That's the part that's supposed to hit the triangle. But then there are other kind of triangle beaters too, like these. These are old Perdell triangles. Now this definitely obviously has rubber here. So this part on this particular triangle beater was actually meant to be the handle. Now, and like I said, this one's a real thin one. This one's even thinner. Let's see what this sounds like. 
So if you have to play something very soft, you might use this one. So those are the two main instruments made out of metal, metallophones, that are used in a concert band and an orchestra. Let's go to number three, which is the gongs. Now gongs can come in all sorts of sizes and types. So if you saw my bass drum demonstration on the skins video, I mentioned about how the bass drum I was using was a 28 inch bass drum. And then you can have bass drums that go all the way up to 36 inches in diameter. Well, the same is true for gongs, and you might even get a couple of gongs that are even larger than 36 inches in diameter. But here's a demonstration gong I have here. I'm thinking this one is two feet in diameter, maybe a foot and a half. I'm thinking two feet. And most gongs have two holes in the top, sometimes more than two holes. And you would suspend them on a big metal stand. I don't have room for the big metal stand today, so I'm just going to hold it up. Now, you could play your gong with various kinds of gong beaters. For instance, if you had a really big gong, you might use a gong beater like this. This is a copy of an AU gong beater that is now produced by Black Swamp Percussion. And this really works better for the really large gongs. But let's see what it sounds like on this one. That's not too bad, right? Now, this gong beater is cool because you got a big flat area if you want to have to play something really loud and you want a lot of contact on your gong. Or it has a little pointed area to give a different sound. So here's the pointed area. And now here's the flat area again. Now that definitely sounded different. And I promise I did not hit the gong any harder between those two times. Or you might get a gong beater that kind of looks like a bass drum beater, except it's kind of, it feels way heavier when you lift it. It's way heavier in the top, in the head. And that would sound like this. So you might notice that right before I played the gong this time, I kind of tapped it really softly with the gong beater. Now, if this was on a stand, I would actually probably tap it a little bit like this with my finger very softly before I played it. And the reason you do that is you want to get this big chunk of metal vibrating before you hit it so that it speaks quickly. These are such large pieces of metal that sometimes you hit them and it's almost like it's it, it the sound doesn't come out for like an eighth note or a sixteenth note, which you may not understand what eighth notes and sixteenth notes are. But the sound comes out of the instrument later than when you hit it. And you don't want that. You want the sound to come out when you hit it. Let's try this again. Okay, let me try this time without, without touching it to get it vibrating before I play it. elementary school and at your high school and at your middle school you may have a mallet that looks like this you may have a mallet that looks like this you may have both kinds oh there are other kinds of gongs as well because like I said there's all sorts of gongs and in the other videos I mentioned about how it's really cool to be a percussionist because you get to play instruments from all sorts of cultures symbols are kind of from the Turkish culture Gongs are from various Asian cultures. Triangles are sort of from the Turkish culture as well. Here's a tiny little gong. This is a specialty gong. It's called a bending gong. A lot of these small gongs have all sorts of very specific sound qualities to them. This one's bending. There's some that go up. There's some that go down. Like they go boing and they go boing. Let's listen to this one. Here it goes, boing. Oh, that was a good one right there. Hear that? So you notice there's lines written there. That's me marking where I think the sweet spot in the gong is. So I aim for that so I get the best bend I can.
So there are a myriad of gongs that have all these kind of special qualities in them. They are also made out of brass. Some of them come from China. Some of them specifically come from Wuhan. And they're very well-made gongs. Um, they're a lot heavier than cymbals. And they're pounded out and spun totally differently. And as you can see, there's no hole in the middle. Cymbals all have holes in the middle. And for the most part, their edges are all bent up like this. Whereas cymbals, unless you're playing a special Chinese cymbal, this, and there's no bent edges around the symbol. So what are some of the other instruments made out of metal that you might see in concert band or orchestra? Well, now we kind of get into some of the uh, instruments from other cultures besides the gongs and the cymbals, of course. So, for instance, uh, one thing you might see on a very regular basis, especially around Christmas time, are, if you can't see them, I'll move them over here, jingle bells. Jingle bells are metal bells with small little metal balls inside of them attached to a wood handle. So you can sound like horses. Usually horses pulling sleighs in the dead of winter. All sorts of music has this sound in it. And sometimes, nowadays, in some of the video games and some of the heroic uh, mystery sci-fi movies, you might hear jingle bells like in the background like this. Totally depends on the imagination of the composer where these will show up, but you almost always have them in a Christmas concert. Oh, and the proper way to play these for you elementary and middle school kids, you notice I have a fluffy filled basket. I got this idea from Dr. Michael Udall from the University of Michigan. So one way you would play it is you'd hold onto the handle and then you would tap it with your other hand. That gives a real good rhythm. Another way you could play them is to just shake them like this. Or if you need to make kind of a rolling sound, you would twist them like this. I've also seen people play them like this. So why the basket? Well, let me see if I can show you that. So if I want to quiet these immediately, very quickly after I'm playing them, because you can see if you kind of like try to put them down somewhere, you can hear me put them down here. The little balls inside the bells ring all the time. So it's really hard to stop the motion. If you move them at all, they make a sound. So if you go like this, I'm over the basket now, and then I just pop them in the basket, it pretty much minimizes the after sound when I'm done playing. Let's see what other fun metal instruments we have here. So of course, as I mentioned in some of the other videos, we do a lot of things with Latin American instruments. And one of the main Latin American instruments made out of metal, of course, is the cowbell. Now, you would mostly hear the cowbell in like popular music. It's not something you would hear all the time normally in concert and orchestra music unless you're doing a pop concert. So, but there's all sorts of different sizes of cowbells. This is a mambo bell. And this is a kind of cowbell that was made famous by Will Ferrell in the More Cowbell skit from Saturday Night Live where he's just doing that. But depending on what rhythm you're playing, you might play it like that. Sometimes you'd see a cowbell like this mounted on timbales, and you play the cowbell with one hand while you're playing a timbale with another hand. Here's another kind of cowbell, a bongo bell. This one is higher pitched. How much higher pitched it is than a mambo? And you can dampen them when you have to, too. Here's a different kind of cowbell, which is kind of more like a Latin... Uh, a, a, a Caribbean cowbell, but you do see it in Latin America. This is the Iagogo bells. Now, you've probably heard this sound before. Definitely made out of metal. Different shape than the first two cowbells. 
has a different ring. Both the top and the bottom have a different ring to them. But here's another cowbell you've probably never thought of before in orchestra or concert music. And this comes from Switzerland and the Alps. This is an actual cowbell with a metal beater in it. Once again, Mahler, guy I talked about when we were talking about triangles and he had like loud music, Mahler was from the Alps. And so sometimes in some of his symphonies, to give the impression that you were sitting on top of an alp, listening down in the valley to the cows just kind of roaming around, eating the grass, he would actually have percussionists mount cowbells and play the cowbells very gently, all different sizes. So it would give the effect of you're sitting on top of that high mountain just listening to the cowbells, cow, cows gently walk around the valley below. I actually got this from a hardware store in Switzerland. There's some crazy sounds that you get when you're a percussionist, and as I've said in previous videos, sound effects are something that we do. Here's another sound effect that we do, and I brought this out in another video as well. This is a metal shaker. The metal shakers sound a little different than plastic. Still get that shaky sound to it though. If you have a Guiro scraper, you can get, particularly on this shaker, because this shaker is made to have a finish on it that acts like a Guiro as well as a shaker. It's what they call a multi-purpose instrument. You can use this section to smaller grooves as a Guiro. Or you can use this section with the larger ribs as a guero. What other Latin American instruments do we have made out of metal? Well, this one is a very special one that you probably won't see in your high school, middle school, or elementary school. But I thought I'd bring it out just to show you some of the unique things that we can get from other countries. This is a guiro made with spring. You see this a lot in Brazil. And it has a little trumpet thing on it, so when you move the trumpet in and out from your body, you get different pitches. So it sounds like this. probably won't see that one when you're in middle school or elementary school for sure and probably not in high school but you never know with high school so what other sound effects do we do when we have metal instruments in the percussion section well here's one that you most likely will see in high school maybe middle school maybe elementary school this is a flexitone this is made to emulate the sounds of a musical saw they actually used to have people with full saws and they mounted them on wood and they would bend the saw and hit it with a mallet or a hammer and it would be able to play melodies with it. This one, you can play melodies with it if you get really good, but mostly this is for making a specific kind of cartoon-like sound, sounds like this. So if you see what I'm doing, I got my thumb on the end of the metal. This is a very flexible piece of metal, hence the word flexitone. And as you bend the metal, it makes the pitch go higher. And as you release it, it makes the pitch go lower. And then these little wood mallets hit against it as you shake it. So if you see one of these in your band hall, that's what it is. It's a flexitone. Oh, here we go. The brake drum. This is an actual brake drum 
I got it from a junkyard. You may not be able to find brake drums anymore because most brakes are discs now, but back in the old days, they were big drums like this with grooves. They sound like this. Sometimes we use them as anvils, or sometimes we use them as the death blow hammer. Some uh, orchestra pieces call for the death blow hammer. And there are entire composers from the late 50s, 60s, and 70s who like to write percussion and other music based on found items. A break drum like this would be considered something they found in a junkyard. Um, there have been composers who have actually taken large oxygen tanks, cut the ends off the oxygen tanks based on um, specific diameters and based on specific lengths to get pitches out of the oxygen tanks. And then they mount the oxygen tanks and you play them like a mallet instrument. I've actually had to do that in a piece once. Lou Harrison's, one of his pieces. Very cool found percussion. Absolutely awesome. Here's another found percussion. I was at a high school doing a concert. And I noticed that the other than the orchestra hall where the concert was, most of the high school was shut down. So I asked the stage manager, why is the high school shut down? And he told me, oh, they're rewiring all the systems. They're putting in electronic buzzers instead of bells so the kids know when classes change over. So I thought, wow, I've heard about this before. Can I get one of those bells? Oh, yeah, we got a stack of them in the back. They've just been putting them, storing them back there until they finally get them all done, and then they're going to ship them out. Can you get me one? Yes, I can. So this is an actual old-school simplex bell from a school. Sounds like this. Now, I don't normally hit it with the hammer, but that's the hardest thing I've got. Let's try a triangle beater. Now, I can use it for a lot of different things. I've used it in an orchestra piece that called for a ship's bell. Kind of sounds like a ship's bell. Also kind of sounds like an old school chime that you might hear in an old grandfather's clock. I think this counts as another kind of found percussion. So the last thing that's made out of metal that I'm going to show you, and you've probably all heard these before, maybe even played one. You might have one in your middle school. You definitely have them in your high school, maybe not in elementary school, is the wind chime or the mark tree. Sounds like this. It's a very pretty sound. So, I don't know if you can see this or not, but these are actual solid rods of metal. They've been cut to specific lengths to get a certain pitch quality out of them. This is a very old set. This is one of the first sets LP made back in the 1970s. It sounds like this. Also made out of metal. Now, you can also get wind chimes made out of glass and some other different kinds of variations as well. And there are also some of them are made out of hollow tubes. So a lot of people who make their own make them out of hollow tubes, like the kind of tubing you might get from a plumbing store. Well, that um, pretty well finishes the um, demonstration of all the various metal instruments that you might see in a concert band or in an orchestra. Just the very basics, what they sound like, what they look like. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I'd like to thank the Livonia Symphony for sponsoring the video. And if you like any of our videos demonstrating the instruments at a very basic, simple level, then please hit the like button below. Keep practicing, and, and thank you for now, and bye for now.